tonight is a new era in conflict. And most of us, I speak for myself at least, are puzzled to a large extent about the nature and threat uh, which we face in the world. Uh, the extent is an issue, and its nature is an issue. Um, and certainly how you cope with it is an enormous problem. And I do believe that the nation is struggling to find its way with respect to these things. Now, we're extraordinarily fortunate tonight to be joined by a gentleman who has reflected on these matters intensively, professionally, and has practical experience in dealing with them. Ambassador Crumpton has a Bachelor of Arts degree, Political Science, University of New Mexico, Master of Arts in International Policy, Johns Hopkins University in Washington. He joined the CIA in 1981. He's been in operations on the operations side of the agency. He's been posted overseas on numerous occasions, I understand at least on four continents. Uh, he's been uh, chief of station on two of those occasions. Uh, he uh, was with the, C the FBI for a year as deputy uh, director of their division that deals with uh, ter international terrorism, 1999 to 2000, or 1998 to 99, and then following that for two years was deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency's Center on Counterintelligence. And strikingly, um, he headed up the group and created the strategies uh, for the operation by CIA officers and uh, military officers as a prelude to our uh, going into Afghanistan, a operation which is applauded in all of the reports that have been written about the time. Uh, Ambassador Crumpton is also known as one of those who made recommendations, not all of which were accepted, for tracking al-Qaeda prior to 9-11. Um, his, his career has been extraordinary with that agency. He's received uh, uh, four of its most distinguished awards, including its highest for distinguished, uh, distinguished intelligence uh, service. Uh, he also has, uh, since going over to the State Department for the last year and a half to serve as their uh, director of, uh, coordinator for counterintelligence, uh, written a couple of chapters in an important book. And he's also received an award for his contributions to the intelligence literature. So we have tonight someone who is deeply grounded theoretically and practically in this enormous problem and who has a track work uh, record of having devoted himself with great dedication and courage uh, to coping with that problem. It's a very special a pleasure to present this evening uh, Ambassador Crumpton. Dr. Hurd, thank you for those uh, warm and generous remarks. And I'd like to thank you and the council and, and all the members for the opportunity to speak tonight. This is my first uh, public engagement since I retired from U.S. government service last Friday. <laughs> 26 years and several weeks, and it was a wonderful experience. It was a great privilege and honor to serve, especially to conclude that service working for Secretary of State Rice as her advisor and the coordinator for counterterrorism in the Department of State. So again, to have this opportunity to speak um, really is pretty special. To come to Baltimore is pretty special, given the history of the city, given the dedication of its many citizens to national service and community service. I think that is reflected in the council here I was going through all the different programs that you have, the outreach, the emphasis on education, the emphasis on leadership, and I applaud you all. I think we'll need much more of that. Tonight, I would like to provide an overview, a broad brush, if you will, of what I believe is the future of conflict. 
Now, this, of course, by definition is speculation, but I would like to refer to some of the trends that we see today and try to project where this might take us tomorrow. I believe sometime between November of 89 when the Berlin Wall fell and September of 2001 when Al-Qaeda attacked us in the homeland, the United States slipped across the threshold into a new era of conflict. There are many challenges that this new era of conflict brings. But what are some of the defining variables? I think there are many, but I can identify at least four major factors. First and foremost is the unique, truly unprecedented degree of asymmetry that we see right now in the world in terms of political and military power. In the aftermath of the Cold War, the U.S. does stand alone as a sole superpower. Now, throughout the history of conflict, you've had asymmetric warfare. You've had assassinations and insurgencies and terrorism. But in this current structure, with the U.S. providing such a force, both as a friend and for some that misperceive U.S. intentions as an enemy, Therefore, I think enemy forces, when they look at the U.S., understanding that they cannot engage in conventional warfare, not engage in that type of warfare and win, they are responding. And this is one of the key variables, key factors. I think enemy forces are becoming smaller and smaller. I refer to these forces as micro actors. Think about 9-11, where 19 operatives were able to bring such destruction. Think about the possibility of a single operative with a pathogen using bioterrorism as a tactic to kill hundreds, thousands, even more. This is unprecedented. And that's really the second point. It's not only about enemy forces becoming smaller and smaller and their behavior that is influenced by this change. They're much faster. They're agile. Think of their decision cycle, a six-man team. They can decide very quickly. They can move very quickly. But what makes this even more unique, I believe, is that these micro actors bring with them macro impact because of the increased sophistication of science and technology. And these enemy forces are able to harness some of this technology, as in 9-11, as in current efforts by several terrorist groups to acquire weapons of mass destruction. This impact is also brought upon us because of the increased interdependence and fragility of our society. Think about cyberspace. Think of how dependent we are upon computer networks. Think about our transportation systems, how advanced these are, and therefore, in some ways, how fragile. So these two factors come together. But there's a third. These micro enemy actors with macro impact operate in a global battle space like we've never seen before. Tom Friedman, in his book, The World is Flat, describes many of these forces of globalization, most of them overwhelmingly positive. Talks about capital flow, human resources, great interdependence and great strength from that. He describes, I think, in great detail how the world is flat in terms of our economies, in terms of societies and culture. But those same factors apply to the battlefield, where you can have a small cell on the other side of the world plotting and planning and within hours or a day or two executing on the other side of the world. They can communicate within seconds through cyberspace. These are fundamental changes to how we wage war. Micro actors, macro conflict on a global battlefield. And the fourth variable, the fourth factor, is the rising importance of non-state actors. Think about this. Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, the FARC in Colombia, these terrorist groups, these are non-state actors. But also think about our allies, or potential allies, and how effective they can be not just nation states, but non-state actors, non-state partners. 
Think of clergy, institutions of moral authority. Think of universities and schools. Think of NGOs, of tribes, militia and their commanders, international organizations, multinational corporations, the media. The nation state will not go away. In fact, it will remain, I think, the most important organizing principle in international affairs, clearly. But in relative importance, the rise of non-state actors in this global battle space is changing the landscape. And we must, in many ways, rethink how we look at this battle space. Let me give you an example. Last year, my office in the Department of State, working with the Swiss government, co-sponsored a seminar, a two-day meeting in Switzerland, where we posed the question, what would happen and who would have responsibilities for a bioterrorism attack? And we worked out a scenario. A small group of operatives unleashing a pathogen going through major international airports and watch the spread of this contagion. But to answer this question, we looked at all the possible players, all the people that would have a role, stakeholders in such a threat and such an attack. There were so many, we couldn't bring them all together for the meeting. So we had to narrow our selection of participants. We decided to focus on the leaders of international organizations, the Red Cross and Red Crescent. International Migration Organization, Interpol, NATO, OSCE. There were about a dozen groups that we brought together, their leaders, for two days. And we posed this question. Given this scenario, what are your respective roles and responsibilities? It was a fascinating education. It was also frightening to look at the overlap, to look at the gaps in responsibility. And think of the consequences for society, global society, in such an event. Think of how transportation companies would need to respond. Think about immigration, public health, the media, multinational cor corporations such as pharmaceutical companies. I believe in some respects this perhaps is unprecedented, certainly since 1648 when the Westphalian system was born and nation states came to the fore. This is about an increasingly complex battle space. Well, what are the specific challenges? I believe, number one, first and foremost, and this reflects my own experience, my own bias, I think it's in the arena of intelligence. And bear in mind, 15 years ago, the aftermath of the victory of the Cold War, there was serious discussion about maybe getting rid of the CIA. A lot of Smart people ask, why do we need an intelligence service, or at least a clandestine intelligence service? We had the peace dividend. Why not cash it in? And now today, look at our intelligence community's budgets. Look at the massive reorganization in the intelligence community. Why is this? I think, in large part, it's because of this environment that I've described. Intelligence is more valuable than ever, and I believe its importance, its value, will continue to increase. Think of the need to identify and find these small enemy forces that are bouncing around a global battle space with such speed and agility. Think how hard it is for the FBI to find a fugitive here within our own borders. Well, imagine trying to find an international terrorist fugitive in Waziristan. Micro actors. The intelligence challenge, perhaps, has never been greater. But it's not only about identifying and finding the enemies. More importantly, it's about penetrating enemy networks, understanding their plans, their intentions. What, what are the strategies? And this is of critical importance. Sun Tzu in The Art of War, he stressed that it's far more effect effective to attack the enemy's strategy, not just the enemy. And I think in this new era of conflict, that's the way we must think about the enemy and how we respond. So the value of intelligence will grow. But not only because of the enemy, 
not only because of their strategy and the way they communicate and their weapon systems, but more importantly, the need to have intelligence about this environment. We in the United States do a wonderful job of mapping physical terrain, elevation, climate, a whole range of factors come into play. But think about mapping the social, political, economic, cultural terrain. Think how important that is and the need to have intelligence. Why? Because we must determine how best to respond to these enemy forces. And what are the consequences of our actions? What will be the impact of our engagement in this terrain? And how can we use this terrain, this human terrain, in our favor, just like we use physical terrain? Intelligence of paramount importance. The second major challenge, I believe, is in terms of how do we engage once we identify the enemy and bear in mind that's not as simple as it sounds. It's not just the act of terror, but think about Al-Qaeda and their affiliates, how they engage us. It's not only about an act of terror, but they also collect intelligence. Think how they use the Internet to case sites here in America and in Europe and around the world. Think how they send operatives forward to case potential targets. Look at Hezbollah, trained by the Iranian Ministry of Intelligence and the Quds Force. They are very sophisticated in terms of their intelligence collection. The enemy also comes at us in terms of propaganda. They also engage us or engage our societies with subversion and with terrorism, and in some places, open warfare. In fact, these are many of the characteristics of an insurgency. So it's not just about counterterrorism, about stopping that horrible attack against innocence. It's about understanding that threat complex and responding to it with a variety of tools. The President of the United States, Secretary Rice, others have repeatedly stressed that we as a nation must use all the tools that we have. All the instruments of statecraft must be brought to bear. But what are those instruments? And how do we combine them? And where do we apply them? Traditional instruments, of course, policy, diplomacy, which is the execution of policy, military force. We're familiar with that, of course. Law, and not just law enforcement, but judicial systems, prison systems, the culture that encourages the rule of law. Another key instrument, of course, covert action. Another instrument, economic power. This is one I think that we have done the least with. Imagine our economic might, the economic might of the G8 nations, of the community of nations. Think of our economic might. Compare that to the economic power of the FARC in Colombia or Jama Islamiyah in Southeast Asia. Why haven't we buried these enemies with our economic power? We harnessed it very well in the Cold War, the power of trade unions and multinational corporations. We need to rethink this. Those are the traditional instruments, some of them. There are others, going back to my point about the importance of non-state actors. Think about the importance of religious authority, of moral authority. Think about the importance of free markets and the rule of law, the role of the private sector. These are also instruments that we need to harness. But once harnessed, how do you balance them? What is the impact of military force in a particular area versus the use of diplomacy or economic power? Sometimes if we don't make the right combination, we can aggravate the situation. In fact, sometimes we can make it worse. And this is part of the new era of conflict, this new global battlefield. How do we use these instruments? And where do we apply them? This is another part. It's not just global. Think of regions. Think of how an enemy, a terrorist organization operates. Look at Al-Qaeda. 
along the Afghan-Pakistan border, the safe haven they secured there. The GSPC in North Africa and the Trans-Sahara, how they operate. They operate in regions. They use national borders in their favor. This is a very important aspect of what we need to do when we look at how to respond. It's globally, it's regionally, nationally, and we do a good job of that because of the Westphalian system, the system we're most accustomed to. But perhaps most importantly, we must engage at a local level. You've all heard the old saw, all politics is local. I think all counterterrorism, all combat is local. And we have to think about those variables because the terrain is not only different from country to country, but from province to province, from valley to valley, village to village. Therefore, when we orchestrate these instruments and when we apply them, they must be calibrated to that precise area, to the needs and the preferences of those people in that particular valley. So we're waging this war. We are applying these instruments, if you will, on four levels, global, regional, national, and especially local. The third major challenge, in addition to intelligence and the orchestration of instruments of statecraft, the third is law. Guantanamo. Why do we have Guantanamo? Why do we have such a divisive debate within our country right now about enemy combatants, combatants that don't belong to a nation state or an army, they belong to a cell or maybe they're simply operating on their own accord. How do we deal with this threat? And it's not only our national laws that are under scrutiny and generating much discussion, it's also international law. If you look at the law of war, it really is about nation states and armies clashing on battlefields. I had a discussion a few months ago with a dear friend, a military, U.S. military colleague. We were discussing the possibility, the real possibility of apprehending certain support elements of a terrorist network overseas. Uh, military would outlined a very compelling plan, and they would have been able to, I think, grab to snatch these operatives. But it was in such a part of the world where there really was no functioning nation state. There was no nation to hand off these criminals. There was no international law or mechanism that would accept these operatives. So we had to let it pass. We're trying to close Guantanamo. And these particular operatives were not engaged in specific acts of terrorism against the United States, but they clearly posed a threat to that region. So what is our role and responsibility? What about the countries in that region? It's a major challenge, a question of law. Of course, there's another challenge. And this, perhaps, I wouldn't say perhaps, is definitely the most important. When we face this new era of conflict and these multiple challenges, these variables that are coming at us fast and furious, how do we protect who we are as Americans, our Constitution, our partnerships around the world? How do we preserve that? Because bear in mind that is one of the aims of the enemy, of Al-Qaeda and others, to undermine our set of beliefs. We must hold fast to that. And this is nothing new. In fact, the ancients taught us this. The Peloponnesian War, written by Thucydides, he stresses how important this is to maintain your identity, to understand who you are. Sun Tzu in The Art of War, he specifies that during conflict, you must, by all means, remain intact. I'm sure there's a better translation. But to preserve who you are. So ironically, in this war, in this great battlefield, this flat globe, where science and technology is driving these changes, these forces of globalization are coming to the fore, paradoxically, it will be more important than ever to hold on to the human values, to understand the nature of conflict, the human nature of conflict. 
who we are, who our allies are, and also the enemy. Because bear in mind, men fight because of many reasons. It's important that we must determine why, because often why men fight determines how they fight. The value of our societies, the value of our fellow citizens, not just here in the U.S., around the world, is going to be a key part of this victory, our victory. Because despite all of these complexities, I am confident that we will pull through this stronger, better than ever. And if you look at the success we've had, and there are plenty of successes, it's an important lesson. You can measure our success in counterterrorism by the success of our partnerships, whether it's with another nation state or a non-state actor, perhaps a tribal leader, an NGO. And that, I believe, will be the key to a more enduring victory. But there's another part, and this is a challenge to the question of our identity and the question of our community. When do we declare victory? When do we sign that document, the VE Day? This is tough for us because the American way of war is that once attacked, we mobilize our forces, we crush the enemy, we emerge victorious, and then we bring our boys, increasingly our women, back home to work in the fields and the factories. But this new era of conflict that I believe we have entered, I think it will challenge our thinking in terms of when do we declare victory. I think that we will certainly defeat the virus of al-Qaeda, but regrettably other viruses will emerge. These forces will continue. But through international partnerships, much like global public health, I believe that we will come through this. I'd like to uh, offer a couple of examples of success and a couple of examples of great challenge. Nation states, Libya, what a remarkable success. Think of how the United States and the partners around the world use all those instruments of statecraft that I outlined earlier over the course of about 15 years and how last year Libya was taken off the list of state sponsors of terrorism. In fact, Libya is now a good partner in the counterterrorism effort. In contrast, think about Iran, the number one state sponsor of terrorism. Think about how they use their sub-state actors like the Quds Force or proxies like Hezbollah, their pursuit of nuclear weapons. And that nexus of weapons of mass destruction and the tactics of terrorism poses a dire threat, not just to the region, but to this global battlefield I've talked about. Another very positive example is Southeast Asia. A couple of years ago, think about those horrible bombings in Bali. Think about the threat that Jamaat Islamiyah posed. Remarkable work by our partners in Southeast Asia in the last couple of years. With our support, the support of Australians and others, remarkable progress in Indonesia, Malaysia, and very recently in the Philippines, where the five leaders of Abu Sayyaf only one is alive. Well, the four have been killed in combat. But it's not just about killing enemy leadership, and Southeast Asia is a good example of that. Once you have engaged the enemy, once you have denied them safe haven, what do you replace that safe haven with or those enemy networks in that safe haven? This is another piece that we have to think about. We've got to think about economic opportunities and infrastructure and build liberal institutions that not just displace but replace those enemy networks in those safe havens. And there are examples of that in Southeast Asia right now. In contrast, an area of great concern, a region of great concern, Iraq and the region around Iraq. We have at least four circles of violence there that make this exceedingly complex. We have al-Qaeda, international terrorism, we have an insurgency. We have increasing sectarian violence, Sunni on Shia. And the fourth circle, criminal violence that is pervasive throughout society. Most of the kidnapping in Iraq is done by criminal groups for profit. But they, in turn, 
might sell these hostages to the highest bidder, their families, their companies, Al-Qaeda, insurgents, others. The Iraq and region will pose problems for a long time to come, I think. One final example, positive and negative. Positive, Afghanistan. Who in this room would have thought in September 2001, five and a half years later, Afghanistan would have a freely elected president, a freely elected parliament, more than four million Afghan refugees coming home, schools populated, bursting at the seams, including many girl students. The Afghan people have done a remarkable job, and we need to honor that success with continued partnership and assistance. Because in contrast, again, I use Afghanistan and Pakistan. We have denied the enemy safe haven, but we have not replaced those enemy networks, especially in the south and eastern part of Afghanistan. They need roads and wells. They need economic opportunity. They need a chance to participate in legitimate economic life. They should be growing subsidized wheat, not poppies. Let me conclude. I'd like to summarize, and then I'd be glad to open it up to some questions. If you'll bear with me, I'd like to uh, read just a, a brief paragraph. Micro-enemy actors with macro-impact operating in a global battle space among more and more influential non-state actors. All this blurs conventional concepts of international security. In this global counterterrorism war, nations using armies and big battles against each other will be less prevalent than state and non-state actors deploying small teams to engage in Waziristan firefights, London police raids, Kuala Lumpur court proceedings, Basilan community projects, Port Angeles border crossings, Dubai financial exchanges, and cyberspace chats. The emphasis is on small. We therefore must define these enemy micro targets with great precision. We must then strike with speed, agility, and proportionate power to include soft power. Most of all, we must not allow our conventional mindset and our fears to conflate the size of enemy forces or the threat we face. Because if we do, our attention will be diffused, our resources wasted, our alliances undermined, our global legitimacy jeopardized, and the enemy enabled. But as in the examples I have outlined, U.S. counterterrorism success can be measured by the success of these partnerships, working together with both our state and non-state partners, crafting the tactical, quotidian counterterrorism operations, and emphasizing the strategic, liberal, democratic, free market forces of globalization we ultimately will win the war against the dark, anti-liberal forces of Al-Qaeda and their affiliates. The U.S. will continue to forge global network partnerships to engage the enemy with all of our collective instruments to protect each other and ultimately our homeland. I'd like to conclude and uh, would welcome any questions or, or comments you might have. The observation uh, and the question is, uh, shouldn't we have more foreign language speaking personnel within our government service? Uh, yes. Uh, 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 we, we are uh, woefully short in that regard. And if you look at the U.S. educational system, um, I think we can start there. And certainly, the government needs to add to that. And more resources are being devoted. Uh, are they sufficient? I think we could do more, especially in the hard languages. These languages that are used in tiny corners of the world, uh, where enemy forces often find safe haven, 
Oh, as an example, uh, Pushtu. We have very few Pushtu speakers. But I beg your pardon? You said Arabic would be a star. We, we have Arabic speakers, not enough, but more and more are coming on board. And I know that uh, there's been some efforts to recruit more um, Arabic Americans, Arab Americans to participate. And I know that based on my experience in Afghanistan in 0102, some of the most effective CIA officers on the ground were Arab American, Muslim American, who not only spoke languages of that area, but also knew the Muslim faith, also knew the cult culture, and they were extraordinarily effective, and I think we need many more. And if I could answer the, the first question, I think, I think the question was related to the importance of, of finance in, in, in this type of conflict. Right. Let's see. The, the question was uh, wars fault for financial gain or financial redistribution, and how does the internet interplay in, into this? I, I think if you look at most of the conflict today, in fact, 80% of all global conflicts are ethnic based. I think while financial redistribution is an important part of this, I think in many respects it runs much deeper. It is a question about identity, um, allegiances. These forces of globalization that I talked about, I think they're causing great stress, especially in some traditional societies. And they're lashing out. They're trying to um, redefine their identity. Um, I bring more of an anthropological perspective to it, perhaps. Uh, and the finances is, is a part of it. Regarding your question about the internet and that, that aspect of it, that's one of the key variables in this flat world. This really does make it a global battle space. And um, we have to think of how do we deal with this. Some argue for a more defensive approach. Uh, I believe that we need to map that cyber terrain just like we map other terrain and use that in our favor. But this is an ongoing debate because we've really never had this before. We've never had cyberspace, and it's a key part of this new era of conflict. Would you uh, comment on the impact of the resolution of the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict upon terrorism in general? The short answer is yes. I think if you could bring peace to the Levant and have the Israel, Israelis and Palestinians coming together, I think it would certainly help the conditions. More broadly, if you look at insurgencies and the history of counterinsurgencies, and I think there are many characteristics of that, there, there are three strategic objectives. One is enemy leadership, the second, safe havens, which I talked about, and the third and most important are those conditions, often very local, that enemy forces exploit. And if you look at Gaza right now, and you're an 18-year-old Palestinian boy, young man, you don't have a lot of options. You don't have a lot of hope. And until you address those conditions and give those youth opportunities to participate in legitimate society, uh, it's going to be tough resolving the problem posed by terrorism. And if you look at al-Qaeda and, and bin Laden and how they attempt to exploit these types of conflicts, of course it's in their favor. You look at how al-Qaeda has exploited the sectarian violence in Iraq, how al-Qaeda attempts to exploit Muslim Christian violence. That's part of their strategy. Our strategy, of course, should be just the opposite, as Secretary Rice outlined. We should seek to resolve these conflicts, and to the extent we can, I believe that we will. I think the question is, uh, uh, would you comment on the complications caused by ancient laws, ancient beliefs, and ancient myths? Um, first, uh, I, I like your term landscape as opposed to uh, terrain. I think uh, that's useful. I might use that next time I give a talk. Thank you. Uh, uh, the second part of, 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 of your comment or the question, uh, yes, you do see uh, leaders, uh, al-Qaeda, bin Laden, others, uh, trying to recreate a false past. They talk about the caliphate, 
and I think they're reaching back into history to a distorted uh, view of history, and they are trying to uh, win converts and to recruit people to this idolized view of the historical past. And of course, it is part of our effort to counter this, and I believe the best way is through the forces of liberal institutions, liberal democracy. Education is a key piece of this because the enemy exploits ignorance. They exploit those who don't have opportunities or hope. So when we look at how to engage enemy forces, education, opportunity is a big piece of it, and it certainly includes debunking these types of myths that some enemy leaders uh, have uh, propagated. The question is, why don't we make massive efforts to uh, help with the economic situation in Palestine and uh, to avoid some of the complications that we face? Uh, it's a great question. I tried to pose the same question when I talked about our economic power, uh, the U.S., the G8, and why we haven't harnessed this and, and, and buried these enemy forces with our economic might. I think part of it is that we are challenged in how we think about war. The American way of war, um, we understand what weapon systems can do. We understand the appropriation process. But when you talk about aid, often that doesn't translate very well into a national security importance. But I think increasingly we must think about economic power. And not just aid. Aid is just the first step to provide the infrastructure, the opportunity, the space, if you will, for private sector investment. This is, this is a, a critical piece of how we think about conflict of the future. The hard power, the military force, or law enforcement, is fundamental because it stops the enemy from killing us and attacking our communities. We have to do this, but I hope with great precision and with proportionate power. But beyond that, all that does is buy us space and time. Then we must think about aid, infrastructure, economic power, the power of law, the rule of law, and bring that into place. You mentioned the Marshall Plan. That's a very good example. Uh, recently, the, the president announced $8.6 billion for Afghanistan. Uh, I think that's a, a, a great big step, but frankly, there needs to be more. And not just from the U.S. The U.S. by far has been the most important contributor to the nation state of Afghanistan, to these Muslim people. And I challenge uh, our Muslim partners to do more. The, the question uh, is, would you comment on, upon the importance of uh, understanding the grievances and views of people that may be described as enemies? As a specific example, he, right. he mentioned Syria. Right. I did not go into detail about this. Um, it's a good question, and I will comment on it for a few minutes. I did refer to the need to define the enemy with great precision, the importance of intelligence. And I'll give you an example in Afghanistan. Immediately after 9-11, when we looked at the threat, we looked at al-Qaeda, and we formulated our response. It was a conscious effort to define the enemy in very narrow terms. The enemy was al-Qaeda. And those Taliban leaders who chose to side with al-Qaeda, and we had given these Taliban leaders opportunities to work with us repeatedly before 9-11, yet even after 9-11, we communicated to them. We didn't go to war against Afghanistan. We didn't go to war against the Afghan people or the Afghan army or even the Taliban. In fact, that strategy in the fall of 01 was designed specifically to bring all those Afghans, really not just to our side, but to enable them to seize their country from those foreigners, those al-Qaeda operatives who had hijacked their nation. I can't think of a better example that goes to the point that you make. And I talked about not letting our fears conflate the enemy. I think we must be very nuanced and very precise and specific when we define the enemy. And for those that are not engaged, especially those not engaged in existential war, like al-Qaeda, for them, uh, I don't think there is much room to negotiate. 
You take terrorism as a tactic away from Al Qaeda, what do you have left? You have nothing. But you must obviously dis make a distinction between Al Qaeda and other groups. You look at Hamas, you even Hezbollah. And I think some leaders in both those organizations are eventually going to have to make a choice. Do they want to take care of their citizens and respond to the needs of their constituents, or do they want to engage in terrorism as a proxy of Iran? And we are cognizant of this, so we certainly don't loop, link terrorist groups all together. Um, but in our response, we must be very precise and give those people an opportunity to have a discourse. And I think in many cases we've done that. Libya is a prime example. And there are other examples that I could give. Would you uh, comment upon the possible consequences of a policy of regime change upon various regimes? I think the United States government is looking to Iran to change its behavior. And it's going to be up to the Iranian people and those Iranian institutions to address that. Now, if you listen to Ahmadinejad and the comments he's made about wiping Israel off the map, about seeking to acquire nuclear energy and certainly nuclear weapons, I think we have to take that very seriously. And at what point do we engage and how do we engage? Also, we must bear in mind that if you look at uh, the Iranian nation, Iranian society, they're exceedingly rich in their culture and their history. And there are li liberal forces at play inside Iran. The demographics alone, the majority of Iranians are born after the 1979 revolution. I think there's a deep urge for them to join the community of nations. They have a great entrepreneurial spirit. So when we think about Iran, again, when we think about Afghanistan or other nation states, we have to differentiate between those various elements. And when we engage, we must engage those various facets, including perhaps especially non-state actors. So when you talk about the U.S. position uh, regarding Iran, it's not black or white. I think there are many variables that are at play, including working with our international partners to pressure a change in behavior. Look at the effort in terms of the nuclear weapons issue. The U.S. has worked tirelessly on that. United Nations they have made some small progress. I hope there'll be more in the future. I think the question is, would you comment upon the success of counterintelligence uh, on both the national and state levels? Mm -hmm. In terms of intelligence reform and how effective it has been, I think uh, if you look at the level of enthusiasm, the number of volunteers to the intelligence community, that's truly remarkable, and the quality of volunteers, the quality of young officers, that's spectacular. Last year, or maybe the year before, the CIA had 135,000 people applying for just a couple of thousand jobs. And uh, from what I've seen in the field, um, when I was working with the CIA and, and, and more recently with the Department of State, I've been deeply impressed by their dedication, their courage, and, and their effectiveness in collecting intelligence. I think about the reforms here in the U.S., I think we're still working through this to see how we can be the most effective. Department of Homeland Security, there's a remarkable American, Mr. Charlie Allen, who's working tirelessly to try to bring these 22 agencies together in terms of intelligence cooperation and link them to state and local. Uh, they are more than 40 fusion centers that are being established throughout the nation. And I've talked to local police chiefs, to state uh, officials about this, and we need to do a better job of linking them into this. Because as I mentioned earlier, all counterterrorism operations are local. That's certainly true in our homeland. The importance of the beat cop who understands his neighborhood, who understands that landscape, has of great value. And, and, and for us, when we think of intelligence, uh, Secretary Rice uh, referred to this in, in her testimony uh, to the 9-11 Commission, said that we have an allergy to intelligence. We, we think of intelligence as this pervasive Orwellian surveillance system. Effective intelligence is not. Effective intelligence is having trusted networks in a particular neighborhood or in a valley, much like that policeman who patrols that neighborhood and knows the people on that block. 
Now we need to link that at a local level into the state, national, and global, those four levels of this battlefield I talked about. And we have a long way to go in that regard. So on one hand, I'm encouraged, but also I understand that we've got a lot of work ahead of us. And there's some good people that are trying to pull this together. Is uh, our weapon sales and distributions counterproductive? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I think a, a big part of this is how do we define our allies and in terms of sales of weapons and where do these weapons go? What's the ultimate destination? And clearly there have been some problems. I believe that when we look at the needs, I think the needs will change. I think they are changing. Uh, whether our defense industry will change rapidly enough is yet to be seen. Uh, again, my personal view is I think we as a nation tend to invest a lot in high-tech, expensive weapon systems. Uh, our allies often view this the same way, but I think in this new era of conflict that I've tried to describe in very, very broad terms, I think while weapon systems will be of value, of course, I think that they need to be geared to micro responses. And we need to rethink this, I think. That's a part of the challenges that, that we face. Would you comment on or make a comparison between the Muslim community of the United States and that as described in either France or England? I, I think that in the U.S. we are blessed with a great sense of identity. We understand what it means to be an American. It's not defined by race or creed or religion. Our founding fathers understood this. Uh, and we've had a bloody history trying to work through those issues. And I think because of that, we are deeply sensitive to this. Perhaps we can be even more sensitive. In discussions with my European partners as recently as December of 2006, there was, in fact, a great deal of envy toward the U.S. because of our ability to integrate immigrants and second-generation citizens here. So I don't think we will ever have the kind of problem that they're facing in Europe right now. I do, however, think that there will be cases of radicalization within the U.S. There already have been a handful, and I think there will probably be some more. And part of the reason is the impact of cyberspace, uh, the impact of this flat uh, global battlefield that I talked about, and that will have some influence here in the homeland. But I would be surprised if it's anywhere near to the extent of the, of the challenges they have in Europe. The, uh, for those of you who are under 40, <laughs> in any case, the question is, has the intelligence community overcome what some people see as the negative impacts of uh, the Frank Church era? Yes, I think so, but I also see other variables that have come into play. And I'll give you a description. Uh, as a, a former uh, uh, CIA operative in the field, uh, prior to 9-11, imagine if the CIA had gone in and killed, assassinated bin Laden. What have been the reaction in the U.S.? Can you imagine the headlines in the papers? Post 9-11, the papers and the public were all wondering why the CIA and the U.S. government didn't go in and kill him. And it was phrased in those terms, those very harsh terms, if you go back and, and look at the media. Well, now the, the, the pendulum continues to swing back to where it was pre-9-11 and to some degree uh, because the brutality, the complexity of this war I've tried to describe has created a lot of confusion. I'll give you another example. Uh, American way of war, the modern way of war, uh, we can bomb from 30,000 feet, and perhaps we will kill some innocent civilians, and we are deeply regretful. But it happens, and we apologize, we often pay reparations, and we move forward. But compare that to a single U.S. clandestine operative shooting a single Al-Qaeda operative in the head down some back alley. 
That smacks of assassination. That's not the way we wage war. But we have to think about this. This is a micro enemy actor, perhaps with a vial in his pocket, a pathogen that can kill tens of thousands of Americans. He's on the way to the airport to get on an airplane. He's in a part of the world where that host country is either unwilling or incapable of, of stopping him. What, what does the U.S. do? And what about that operative? Will he be prosecuted under international court, under U.S. law? And what about your view? Would you support such an action? Would you pull the trigger? These are some fundamental questions that we have to answer when you talk about intelligence and covert action and the future of war, the future of conflict. Would you comment on the, the impact of the media on policy in general and how we're waging the war in Iraq in particular? I have enormous respect for the media. You look at the number of journalists who've been killed in the line of duty trying to capture these stories, it's truly remarkable. And the value they bring, not just to U.S. society, but to the world. Uh, the importance they play in liberal institutions, which I have emphasized in my discussion. The growing challenge with the media, though, again, it's because of these new forces of globalization and science and technology and the means of communication. How you define the media is even being questioned. Right now, the media can be a single person with a camera and a link up to uh, the internet to broadcast some horrible photos of terrorist acts in Iraq. That's a micro actor with macro impact. He doesn't have a nuclear bomb in his suitcase, but he's projecting some horrible images on the internet. That really is part of the media world now. And so from that perspective, I'm deeply concerned. And how do we govern that? How do we build the type of institutions, the type of values that can address that type of attack? And that really, really is what it is. It's a propaganda attack. Uh, I don't have the answer for that, but it's going to be a growing problem. We, uh, we try to adhere absolutely rigidly and uncompromisingly to our 10 minute after 7 deadline. So to everyone who has a question, I apologize. To Ambassador Crumpton, I express our gratitude for a marvelous evening.